time dilation is a fundamental property of an expanding universe. In an expanding universe, it is directly linked to cosmological redshift. This means that events observed at cosmological distances, so a significant redshift, appear to take longer than they would if they were nearby. As space expands, the light takes increasing amounts of time to reach us over the course of the event. The lengthening ratio is the same ratio as the redshifted wavelengths from the same distance. There have been a number of claims by groups working on gamma ray bursters that time dilation is seen in the stretching of peak to peak timescales. This has then been used to support the argument that bursts are at a cosmological distance. It is questionable if the argument can be inverted to provide convincing evidence for the existence of time dilation. More direct observations of time dilations has come from the measurements of decay times of distant supernova light curves and spectra. Nonetheless, their results would seem to provide strong evidence that time dilation has been observed. If time dilation occurs in supernova, it must also happen in some of the oldest objects we observe, quasars. A variety of groups have looked for time dilation in quasar-like curves, but so far no convincing evidence has been found. In this episode, I want to explore how the data from one paper is interpreted in two different ways where the authors of both papers come to very different conclusions, both of which contain important considerations. Let's dive in and find out more. We will start by examining the paper by M. Hawking's titled Time Dilation and Quasar Variability, and then examine a paper by C. Rourke who uses Hawking's data to come to a very different conclusion. In order to measure time dilation in quasar-like curves, it is necessary to find a way of characterizing the timescales of variations. The most popular parameterization to date has been the structure function, and several groups have measured it for samples of light curves. The main drawback of this is that the points are independent of each other, which causes error analysis and makes it very difficult to interpret. Fourier power spectrum analysis has not been used much in the analysis of quasar-like curves. It requires a long run of evenly spaced data, but provides some significant advantages over the other methods, which are primarily in the interpretation of the data. Hawkins uses this method to analyze a large sample of quasars, which have been monitored every year for 24 years. In total, they identified 600 quasars with redshifts in the range of 0.1 to 3.5. All the quasars used in the study fluctuated significantly in brightness over the 24-year period. For the study of time dilation, they first made the assumption that the light variations are intrinsic to the quasar, so the light curves are subject to the effects of time dilation. They then rescaled the time intervals to effectively remove the effect of time dilation. This should result in no trend of timescale with redshift. In this graph, we can see the power spectra of samples of quasar-like curves binned according to the redshift and luminosity. Each point represents the average value of all the contributions to the frequency interval. The top two panels show results for two luminosity bins, with power spectra for low and high redshift quasars being represented by filled and open circles. If the timescales of the quasar-like curves were subject to time dilation, one would expect no displacement between the two curves. The power seems to show clear displacement. The power spectra are separated by 0.15 in the log in both luminosity bins. This is close to the offset produced by allowing for a 1 plus z scale change, on the basis of the mean redshift of the bins. There is also an indication that the power spectra have moved horizontally rather than vertically. The bottom two panels show similar data for two redshift bins. In this case, low and high luminosity quasars are represented by closed and open circles respectively. The mean redshift for the high and low luminosity data in each plot only differs by about 0.03 in the log, and therefore the removal of a 1 plus z factor should make little difference. The two luminosity bins are well separated, which implies more power or shorter timescales for low luminosity objects. Hawkins makes no assumptions about the nature of the quasar variability in the paper, but carried out the power spectrum analysis in the observer's reference frame. 
In this diagram we can see the power spectra of quasar light curves as before, but this time with no correction for time dilation. For the two luminosity bins in the top two panels it will be seen that all spectra show well defined linear relationships. In other words, the power law. On the basis of the mean redshift for each of the bins, the effect of time dilation should result in a horizontal offset of 0.15 between the power spectra in each of the two top panels. In fact, in each case, the high and the low redshift data are superimposed, showing no change of timescale with redshift. The two redshift bins in the bottom two panels once more show well-defined power laws for the power spectra, and in this case it is clear that low luminosity quasars have more power on shorter timescales. This effect can also be seen by comparing the slopes of the power spectra for low and high luminosity quasars in the top two panels, and confirms that the power spectra are consistently measuring changes in timescale. So what does this all mean? Hawkins uses this data to point out that this implies quasars do not suffer the effects of time dilation. This is of course a big problem for the idea of an expanding universe, where there must be time dilation. Hawking's offers a number of alternatives to explain the discrepancy. If the timescale of the quasar variations were a function of wavelength in the sense that the timescales were shorter in bluer passbands, then this might possibly exactly offset the effect of time dilation. This could be directly tested. In this diagram we can see the power spectra for a sample of about 200 quasar-like curves, in blue and red passbands. If there were a correlation of timescale with wavelength, then the two power spectra should be separated by 0.18 on the log scale, corresponding to the effective wavelength of 436 nanometers and 665 nanometers for the blue and red passband. In fact, the data for the blue light curve appears to be systematically offset from the red one by 0.06 in the log. Another alternative he suggests is that the time scale of quasar variations decreases by a factor of 1 plus z towards high redshift by some as yet unspecified physical process, to exactly cancel out the time dilation effect. This would require an almost cosmic conspiracy to achieve the required fine tuning and plot shown and would make this almost impossible. So how can we explain the lack of time dilation seen in quasars? Hawking's outlines three possible reasons, all of which conflict with the broad consensus in the astronomical community. The first is that the time dilation is not a property of the universe. The reason mainstream astronomy requires time dilation is because the universe is expanding in their model. So no expansion would also mean no time dilation. The second possibility is that the quasars are not at cosmological distances. Although hotly disputed back in the 1970s, there is now evidence that shows quasar host galaxies at high redshifts, making this an unlikely possibility in his view. The third possibility he outlines is that the observed variations are not intrinsic to the quasar, but caused by some intervening process at lower redshifts, such as gravitational microlensing. There is an opposing view that the variations in quasars are dominated by instabilities in the accretion disk, but the debate centers on whether the mechanism is responsible for the long timescale large amplitude variations which dominate the power spectra discussed in this paper. He concludes his paper by admitting that none of these explanations are satisfactory, and leaves open the question for the absence of a time dilation effect in quasar power spectra. Let's now move on to a response paper by C. Rourke based on Hawking's original paper. He starts by reiterating the fact that redshift and time dilation are effectively identical in general relativity, and then stresses the paradoxical findings from Hawking's paper, where we see redshift without time dilation. He moves on to discuss Hawking's results and points out that the results need not be paradoxical and that instead it shows that for the selection of quasars, the sources of radiation and the time variation are not in the same place. For the ease of discussion, he calls these the generator and the modulator. Although mainstream has a clear definition of what the generator is, there is no similar consensus for the modulator. 
For active galaxies, it is believed that there is a central black hole and that this is surrounded by a rotating accretion disk or other structure. Quasars and active galaxies are considered to be part of a spectrum of phenomena associated with black holes. Therefore, quasars should also be surrounded by similar rotating accretion structures. These are composed of gas and plasma close to the centre and further out more solid objects, all of which are trapped in the orbit around the central mass. The radiation from the generator passes through these surrounding layers on its way to us. He goes on to point out that therefore the observed variations are due to non-uniformity in these layers and are naturally periodic with the possibility of several different periods coming from different layers superimposed. So how would this explain Hawking's results? Rourke's idea is that the generator is subject to gravitational redshift because of the black hole nearby, and because the modulator is some distance away it is not subject to the same redshift, and this explains the dichotomy between Hawking's results. Because of the gravitational redshift the quasar is close and less luminous than would be the case if the redshift was entirely cosmological. This is therefore an intrinsic redshift and implies that for a large class of quasars, the generator and the modulator are some distance apart with the modulator in a region of low cosmological redshift. The modulator must lie on the light path from the generator to us. There are two possibilities he outlines. It lies close to the generator, which therefore has an intrinsic redshift, or it lies on the path to us and close enough to us for cosmological and redshift to be small. He rules out this last possibility as implausible, leaving just intrinsic redshift as his solution. At this point it is probably useful to dive a little deeper into his model. In a separate paper he wrote together with Enriquez and McKay, they explain it in more detail. One of the reasons gravitational redshift has been disregarded for quasars concerns angular momentum. If the surrounding medium of the black hole has even a very small angular momentum about the centre, then conservation of angular momentum will create large tangential velocities as infalling matter approaches the centre, and this will tend to choke off the inflow and prevent accretion. This has led to the subject being dominated by the theories of accretion disks. If the observed radiation comes from an accretion disk, affected by local gravitational effects, there would be wide spectral lines, redshift gradients and not narrow ones as observed. A simple consequence of the inertial drag effect is that the rotating body can absorb angular momentum. If the angular momentum can be nullified by central rotation, then it does not force the existence of an accretion disk and redshift can be largely gravitational. In their model, black holes radiate by converting the gravitational energy of incoming matter into radiation. There are two significant regions, an optically thin outer region and an optically thick inner region, which are separated by a sphere which we call the Eddington sphere. The radiation we see comes from a narrow band near the Eddington sphere and which is all at roughly the same distance from the central black hole. This allows the radiation to exhibit a consistent redshift and no redshift gradient would be present. They go into a lot of detail outlining their model, but to summarise, quasars are not distant objects but are instead objects which are much closer. They have a black hole at the centre and they do not have an accretion disk and the redshift that we observe is intrinsic and is created via gravitational redshift. Now one point to consider here is one that we discussed when we looked at the variable mass theory, the Lyman alpha forest problem. In this paper they actually use this as a piece of evidence. To recap, these are thought to be produced by clouds on the path to us which are at different redshifts so create a series of absorption lines that change. They outline that the forest suggests strongly that there is a settling process that takes place in the outer region forming strata. These strata are responsible for both the observed Lyman alpha forest, but also the quasar variability. They do concede that there are complicated features for many quasars which are not adequately explained by this simple model, even with added absorption clouds and strata. For heavier quasars, especially those with jets, this model is not sufficient. I think the most important takeaways from both of these papers is 
Based on Hawking's analysis, there is a clear and large set of quasars that do not exhibit any time dilation. This cannot be explained using the current model of quasars, nor an expanding universe. I'm intrigued by Rourke's paper as it presents a very different concept for looking at this problem. By separating the generator from the modulator, it is possible to look at the problem in a new light. The idea of there being a series of strata surrounding the central object and that it is the settling of these that create the Lyman Alpha Forest is a very interesting concept that bears consideration for other theories that rely on intrinsic redshift. I would be interested to know if anyone else has come across either of these two papers, and in particular Colin Rourke's work. He seems to have written and co-written a number of papers which cover a concept without the Big Bang, dark matter, dark energy, or an expanding universe. This may not have been that obvious from the bits I included here of his work, but may be worth exploring in more detail. I will put a link to his book on a new paradigm for the universe, as well as the other links to the papers I discussed down below in the description. I hope you found this a useful insight in a slightly different direction when considering the origin of Redshift. If you would like to help support this channel, you can directly from YouTube using the Super Thanks button, or via PayPal, or you could join the others and become a patron via Patreon. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.